Hello my friends, it's Matt Christopher and welcome to my Exposed series on Jehovah's Witnesses. This video is one that I spent a lot of time uh, looking at uh, and preparing for you because there's just so much going on here and I think for those who are really interested in how Jehovah's Witnesses operate and the techniques that they use to um, to control people and may I say to enslave people um, is very paramount in the video that I'm going to discuss. Now I have been commenting on the series of turnaround stories and redemption stories that Jehovah's Witnesses have been presenting through JW.org and this time I'm going to look at a man called Mitchell Birdwell. Now Mitchell Birdwell presents very well as a mature age man and comes across as a very, very decent man. Now what we learn about um, Mitchell is that he is a faithful witness of Jehovah's Witnesses. He's a good dad. Uh, his wife is a regular pioneer, and for those who are not aware of what that term means, it is someone that uh, decides to dedicate um, a set amount of hours in the ministry or the door-to-door -door activity that Jehovah's Witnesses pursue. His children, uh, both a boy and a girl, are faithful Jehovah's Witnesses as well. And on top of that, Mitchell is serving not only as an elder in his local congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses, um, but he is trusted with being involved uh, in the oversight of their, their construction. And the story picks up where Mitchell is uh, invited to go to Japan um, as an international volunteer for one of Watchtower's projects. Now, the theme of this, um, this testimonial by Mitchell Birdwell is called, very in interestingly, I thought that I had it all together. And I want you to focus on the word I thought. We're going to return back to that uh, soon enough. So he goes to Japan um, as a, a trusted member um, of the Jehovah's Witness Building Committee. Um, and uh, in Japan, he has this light bulb moment, this shining light on the road to, the, to Damascus moment. And it really is that. Now, before I go into what the turnaround story was, for Mitchell Birdwell, uh, he says previous to that, and that is that I thought that I had it all together, he says that um, I thought that I had it all together, and then he says a perfect little family. And I want you to think about that. So here is, just before we do the deep dive, um, a mature age Jehovah's Witness elder who is a good father. Um, he's married. His wife is supporting. She's very active in her Jehovah's Witness ministry. He has uh, loyal and faithful Jehovah's Witness children. And on top of that, um, he's going to be serving um, overseas to further watchtower interests in their building and construction. But there's a bit of an ominous sign just before he heads off to Japan. He said that he owned a successful uh, custom, uh, custom building business. So he's a builder. And then he said he had just finished his dream home. Okay. Now, just before we go into why there's this need for redemption of Paul Mitchell Birdwell, I want to say this. Mitchell Birdwell and his family seem perfect. Watchtower could have just simply ended it there. They could have said, well, look at Mitchell and his wife and the children, they're faithful, they're serving their community. 
Yes, he's uh, looking after his family by being a builder, and as we know, that Jehovah's Witnesses are adamantly opposed to higher education. And so he's done what he's been asked. He hasn't got involved in higher education, but has pursued a career to earn money for the family uh, in the building and construction industry. So he should be an absolute poster boy. His family should be uh, a poster family for the best life ever for Jehovah's Witnesses. But alas, my friends, nothing could be even close to the truth. You see, there's a problem and a big one is coming at a pace for poor Mitchell. The story picks up, he goes to Japan, and while he's there in this construction work, um, he realises that the Japanese Jehovah's Witnesses on this particular um, construction site are all regular pioneers. So that means that they, um, apart from doing their work, physical work in terms of construction for Jehovah's Witnesses, they dedicate their time also predominantly to their preaching work. Now, he says to them, how do you keep your balance? Very interesting, this idea of balance, which is the center point between two objects or something that is neither top heavy or is tilting in any way. It's actually perfectly even. That is what being balanced is. Now, they say to him, this is at a meeting, they say to him in, in, uh, in relation to his question, which seems to fire them up, they direct him to read Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. And he says they get him to read it not just once, but twice aloud in front of this group. Now, in paraphrasing, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 basically says, if you put God's kingdom first, all other things will be added to you. And the Japanese Jehovah's Witness there says that if you believe, if you really believe that, that um, that is the case, that Jehovah will look after you in all regards. Now, he says, and this is where things start going downhill and the manipulation, the guilt and the shame and the public humi humiliation of a genuinely decent man that anybody would say certainly has done more than his fair share for his faith and his family is publicly humiliated. He says, and I'll just read this, he said that he was standing there, this is after reading the Bible verse in Matthew uh, chapter 6 and verse 33. He said, I was standing there with the Bible in my, in my hand and I felt so little. Why does Mitchell have to feel so little? What has he done? Well, the point is this, he goes on to tell us that that night he couldn't sleep and he kept playing it over and over in my head, he says. And, he, and in the self-talk he says, and this is the programming starting to bite in, why don't I believe? Now, friends, there's nothing so far in the video that in any way indicates to anybody that Mitchell is a non-believer. In actual fact, everything that he does should indicate that his faith is central to his life. Anyway, the next day, one of the Japanese Jehovah's Witness elders approaches him again, circling again. And then discusses with him, basically he said, can I, and this is the word that is used, can I analyze your life? Then he goes to tell him that he, um, he wakes up in the morning. There's a total stranger, says to, to Mitchell, you wake up in the morning with a telephone call. And then 
describes the duties that he would uh, be involved with, whether it's being a local elder, whether it's being on the regional building committees, whether it's running a business, whether it's a family, family affairs. And he said at 10 or 11 o'clock at night, he said, do you then, you're, you're falling asleep. And then he says, why do you, this is, this is incredible, why do you only spend tired time with your family? Can you see this building, friends? They've got this strong man and they are going to pummel him. They are going to make him feel that what he is doing is an absolute and utter failure. Anyway, he then says, and this is beyond belief. This is this is the working of this. This is the the psychological mind game starting to bite into his subconscious. He says this. I remember as a child, we played that game where you leaned over and someone would catch you. And then he says, I never liked that game. Neither did I. Okay, he said, but that is the way that Jehovah is. And I'll read that again. He said, I remember as a child, we played that game where you leaned over and someone would catch you. I never liked that game, but that's the way Jehovah is. Okay, so what's going on? So he goes back and they make arrangements clearly to either wind up the business, to sell the home and other things. And then he says that uh, you can trust Jehovah and even if you don't know how it's going to happen or when it's going to happen, you just know that it's going to happen. Now, my friends, I'm going to go back to the theme again. I thought... I had it all together. So the thing is, Mitchell Birdwell, according to the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses, was living in a fantasy world. A fantasy that he had the perfect little family. According to the governing body, he didn't. Okay. And that even that he was a busy elder in his local congregation in the regional building committee running a successful business and being a good role model in the Jehovah's Witness style of bringing up his children, his boy and his girl to being Jehovah's Witnesses that was all just a hoax to them it wasn't until he was willing to not know what he was doing, where he was going, where he was going to get his next meal from, when he had absolutely no ability to look after his family and that he was completely and utterly tied to Watchtower in which he was playing this game of closing his eyes and waiting for someone to catch him, that that's when he was living the best life ever. Now, what is incredible about this propaganda piece is this. Did he stop being an elder? No. Did he stop being in the regional building committee? No. In actual fact, he is indicating that he had more responsibility. Now, the Japanese witness tells him as some kind of uh, soothsayer and fortune teller that he can tell him what his life is. He's got phone calls in the morning and phone calls during the day and busy and he gets home at 10 o'clock at night. His family only sees him tired. All he's done is he's swapped one construction company for another because that's exactly what he's doing. 
The only difference is he now needs a miracle to make ends meet. He's not going to be any less tired up. Okay? You're still using the same amount of energy doing what you're doing. Now, this to me is the most dangerous of all of the personal testimonies that Jehovah's Witnesses have produced in their turnaround story and prodigal stories. The others of the South American um, criminal who found Jehovah's Witnesses in prison is nothing short of a puff piece. The Canon Benaldi story where he didn't even have the maturity to be able to keep down a job when he left the loving organisation and became an alcoholic and a raving drug addict and had the morals of an alley cat and returned home to his parents um, in a destitute manner is nothing short, that, short of fear-mongering that somehow uh, the world outside the four walls of the Kingdom Hall is unfathomable and unlivable. But this really gives us the deep and perplexing and dangerous psychological warfare that is going on. Now, why? If you have a look at the scripture there in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, yes, it does say that those that put the kingdom first, all things will be added to you. What they never explained is what did Jesus say about when that was going to happen? Did Jesus promise his disciples that if they gave up mothers and fathers and fields and businesses for the sake of him, that they would get them right here and now? No, no, they wouldn't. That was not for this time. So the idea that you give up, as in the case of Mitchell, you give up these things, the idea that you can just throw yourself and miraculously your bills and your responsibilities are simply just taken care of is nothing short of a dangerous farce. Another thing is this. We know that Anthony Morris III, one of the most prominent members of the all-powerful governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses, has said that there will be no lawyers and doctors in their new system, and so builders are needed. But the fact is this, the simple reality is that even when somebody follows the direct recommendations of the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses and is a faithful and diligent Jehovah's Witness with their wife pioneering, faithful children, doing the best they can for their local congregation and also helping in the building work of um construction work, I should say, for Jehovah's Witnesses. This is not enough. This is an outrage. And I want to say this, that someone like Mitchell Birdwell deserve better than to be accused of not having faith. He deserved better than being made to feel that I thought I had it all together. Mitchell you did. You're a wonderful provider, and that is so important, even for Christians. You see, Mitchell, the Bible, if you're interested in it, says that a man that doesn't provide for his family is worse than those who do not believe. So the onus is on people to use their skills to earn a living. You did nothing wrong. This is I believe, the most dangerous aspect of Jehovah's Witnesses. If a person leaves their secular life thinking that they're going to have a life in which they'll be able to have rest time and, and break and time to contemplate, time to be able to think about life and the beautiful planet that we're on and to enjoy 
what life really is about. That's not going to happen when you're on an international construction site. The only difference is you don't own the building. My friends, I hope that this discussion here is thought provoking. Please go and check it out on jw.org. And that is the experience of Mitchell Birdwell. I can simply say, if you've been convinced that you didn't have it all together, you're in a world of trouble. Thank you very much for listening. I'm Matthew Christopher. Thank you.